answering beliefs. Hello everyone, my name is Utsav. I'm an F1 doctor at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington in London. I'm Dr Tierley, I'm an anaesthetic registrar based in Liverpool. Of course, answering beliefs can be a very daunting part of life as a junior doctor. However, when done correctly, it's an art well worth learning. So let's get started. Learn how to use your hospital bleep system. So for example, in our hospital, we have to dial 81 and then put the four digit bleep number of the person you wish to bleep and then the five digit extension followed by the hash key. Uh, learn how your internal bleeping system works so that you get very comfortable with bleeping people and it saves you a lot of time having to ask around other people during what may be a busy shift. The first thing to say about answering bleeps is just to find out how your local hospital systems work. Some um, hospitals are moving on to mobile phones now. Download the induction app, it's a little yellow app, um, and it works for all hospitals in the UK and has a list of all the numbers and um, for different departments and wards in your hospital. So you just set it up for your hospital. If you're not by a ward phone or you want to know who's calling you, what you can do is you can type the number that you've been bleeped into the app. Number one, if that number's saved on the induction app, you can see who's calling you. So you can go, oh, it's Ward 27. Um, and know roughly what they might want, so that can be helpful. The other thing is if you're not by a phone, you can actually call and it will auto-populate the first part of the hospital telephone number and then you can just call while you're on the move and it just makes answering bleeps a bit easier. Bleep functionality. So what I mean by that is whether the bleep actually works. What I normally do is I take the battery out and click it back in again so that it produces a sound. The other way is to actually just call the bleep number and see if it bleeps out. Some bleeps have buttons that can adjust the volume so you can hear it clearly. This is important, especially during nights where you might need a 20 minute rest or nap to recharge. I would never recommend putting it on silent or vibrate, even if that's an option on your bleep. Remember that the bleep is your responsibility. And if you don't attend a potentially urgent call that you missed because the bleep is either on silent, broken, or run out of battery, this is still your responsibility. As um, enticing as it may seem, to carry a malfunctioning bleep and not be disturbed for the rest of your on-call shift. At times, you may be the only doctor who is answering a crash call or a medical emergency team call, so-called a met call. So it's very important that you are contactable at all times and don't face the fury of the site practitioners. At the start of your shift, always make sure that you attend handover prior to your on-call shift. Make sure you know which bleep number that you are going to be carrying for the duration of that shift and test your bleep at the start to make sure that you are easily contactable and that your battery for your bleep is working at all times. If you do have a problem with the battery when it runs out, most bleeps will have AA battery compatibility and batteries can most commonly be found on the ward clock desk or the receptionist desk. Just ask if in doubt. And if your bleep is just completely non-functional, you just need to call switchboard and bring it to them so they can provide you with the functioning one and it's usually with the same original number that you've had before. It's always good to have a standard statement so that when you're uh, pressurised under a lot of tasks and you're being bleed by a lot of people, uh, you just go straight onto autopilot. And so it may just be, for example, something along the lines of, hello, this is the medical house officer on call, how can I help? Always introduce yourself, just pick up the phone and say, hi, it's Lorna, Pete's on call, how can I help? Don't be afraid to ask questions about why they're asking for review, gather as much information as you can, because that can then help you prioritise how urgently you need to go and address that. Just be really friendly, everyone's stressed and busy, especially on on-call shifts, so if you can be a friendly voice, someone who is approachable, that can just make everyone's shift go a bit better. I would normally keep a paper track of where and where the bleep came from, as well as the specific request for future reference and then also triaging patients when you're on call. If you're writing patient details on that piece of paper, remember to dispose of this in a confidential waste bin before leaving the hospital. Calling switchboard is actually really useful to identify any missed bleeps. So say, for example, you get bleeps in quick succession by different numbers, you can call switchboard to get them the extensions of what's had before, and also even ask which department or ward this extension came from. Answer them as soon as you can because there's someone at the other end waiting um, for you to call them back, waiting by the phone. If you're really busy and in the middle of the something, just make a note of the number and then you can call them back as soon as possible. If I'm really nearby, sometimes I'll just say, 
um, I'll come to the ward and I'll just speak to you in person, that's easier. If you're in the middle of something really urgent, get someone to answer the bleep for you or answer it quickly and say, I'm really sorry, I'm in the middle of an emergency. Can I just take a number and we'll call you back as soon as we can? Important bleep numbers that I think would be very useful for any F1 to be aware of. My go-to team members would be the medical SPR on call, as they are the main person that I'm going to be escalating my concerns about sick patients to. The medical SHO on call, and they're going to be somebody I'm going to be escalating if I feel the patient is unwell but not at acute risk of destabilizing. Critical care outreach, they're also very, very useful and they are often a gateway to ICU. So whenever you are worried about an acutely unwell patient and you feel as though your SPR and SHO are both going to be tied up, then critical care outreach or CCOT are a very, very good resource to tap into. Uh, there's also an ICU referrals SPR bleep. So this is for the specialist registrar who's accepting referrals for patients who may need ICU admissions, and you may need to bleep them in order to hand over sick patients to them. And finally, the site nurse practitioners or the SNPs. Uh, site nurse practitioners are very highly skilled, very experienced nurses who are more in leadership and managerial roles and are managing the entire hospital premises uh, when they are working on their shift. They will be your go-to when you're struggling in the middle of the night if you are struggling to take blood from someone, struggling to cannulate someone, or struggling to take an arterial blood gas or a penis gas from someone. And they're also, or pretty much all of them are trained in managing critically unwell patients and will be your gateway to ICU as well. Common things being bleeped for. These are usually cannulations or bloods, fluid prescription, and sedation requests. So for cannulation, you need to only find out two things. First, why the patient needs one, and second, the agency required. So if nursing staff, for example, request a cannula for a patient who's on day six of seven of IV flucloxacillin for resolving leg cellulitis and they're not septic and they're stable, but you've also been asked to review a sick DKA at the acute medical unit at three in the morning, it would obviously be prudent to attend to the latter rather than the former. But it doesn't mean ignoring the cannula request. You have, always have to safety net. In this example, you could ask your colleagues if they're free, or if you can't get anyone to help you, you could think about converting this antibiotic into orals for the time being until you get there later. Also work efficiently. So when you receive this call, you can also ask the nursing staff to prepare stuff that you need for cannulation so that you don't waste any time trying to find bits and bobs in an unfamiliar ward. If they also need bloods, just make sure to double check with the staff and also make sure that the correct boxes and stickers have already been printed out and laid out for you. On a side note, I'd like to stress in these tips myself, we're not a cannulation service. However, we will attend and help with cannulation issues if appropriate escalation has been tried, mainly being your registrar on call, and that IV medication is the only and urgent way of treating the sick patient. Next is fluids. Again, you ask two questions. First of all, what is it for? Maintenance or resuscitation? The second is why can't the patient take orals? With anything you prescribe and administer, be aware that you can give, but you can never take back. Also remember that if you give a patient a litre of crystalloid, they'll only keep around 250 mils within their vasculature. You really need to look at the fluid balance chart, along with their recent use and ease, and make an informed and not an automatic prescription. Patients have died from overload due to overzealous fluid prescription, so be wary. The final thing is sedation. These requests usually occur during night shifts. So you kind of want to ask yourself and also the person requesting this three questions. First is again, why? Just because a patient may be loud and staff on the ward wants a comfortable shift is not a requisite for sedation prescription. The second is, is there an alternative to non-pharmacological measures, such as cohorting a patient to side room or one-to-one -one nursing? The third and final question, which I feel is the most important, is that is there an, another organic reason as to why this patient is agitated? So think about head to toe, is it possibly a traumatic brain injury from an unmissed fall? Is it chest sepsis, constipation, blood catheter causing retention, electrolyte disturbances? Don't take sedation requests lightly and don't prescribe what the ward staff just want you to prescribe. Another thing to be aware of is the difference between a crash call and a medical emergency call. So a medical emergency call would be, for example, when a patient is meeting the medical emergency criteria, which you can find in the ALS manual or on the Rhesus Council website, uh, and is very similar to the SARS criteria when you're worried about the acutely unwell or deteriorating patient. 
All members of the crash team will normally attend the Met call apart from an anaesthetist. So if you need an anaesthetist, it's very important to put a crash call out rather than a medical emergency call. Fast bleeping is a method which is very useful if you want to bleep one specific individual very quickly. So for example, if you really need to speak to the medical registrar about a patient, but you don't think that they are peri arrest or they're going to lose their airway, you don't need the crash team, you don't need the medical emergency team, then you can fast bleep the med reg on call. Another example would be if you are struggling in the middle of a practical procedure and you would need an anaesthetist, for example, you can fast bleep an anaesthetist. You do it when you need one specific member of the team rather than the entire crash team. And the way it would work is that their bleep would go off a bit like a crash bleep, but it wouldn't be the entire crash team that would be coming. It would just be that one individual and their, and their beeper might say, um, on call anaesthetist, please attend the general surgical ward. On call anaesthetist, please attend the general surgical ward. Um, and that would be it. You're in a new environment that's unusual, working shifts for the first time, and now you're aware that you're responsible for your patients. So when I first started my F1 on call, I kind of felt like a bit of a fraud because for me, applying the theoretical that I recently learned in med school into real-time settings was quite difficult. Those before and after me all felt the same kind of imposter syndrome, and then reality came to a sudden hit when the bleep rang. The common feelings that junior doctors encounter is a mixture or a cycle of stress, getting a barrage of bleeps and jobs that just keep piling up. The frustration and sometimes the anger that ensues, the feeling of being overwhelmed mixed with the cocktail of tiredness of working 12 hour shifts. Of course, that's a lot to take in. So the uncertainty and anxiety is a natural human feeling. It's really important to acknowledge these potential feelings now. You're not alone in this. Everyone, no matter how well they hide it, will be feeling the same. It just gets much better with practice and the more on calls that you do the more comfortable you will feel the more experience you will get and you always have seniors around and it's just very important to be aware take these precautions make sure your bleep is working make sure you know how to bleep someone have a very good standardized way of giving and receiving information and make sure that you have the bleep members of uh, the said specialties that I mentioned. Be friendly, um, answer it as soon as you can, get the information you need um, and just make sure you're familiar with the hospital system. Your patients, adaptations to your studies in this current climate and upcoming help in this pandemic will be very much appreciated. So thank you in advance. Thank you very much and see you soon.